this is Ralph Langer. I taught filmmaking, so I took my Super 8 camera to Monroeville Mall to be a zombie. They gave us a dollar. They put us in the community room and slathered us with makeup. This is my brother getting makeup by Jeannie Jeffries. She was Tom Sabini's assistant, and she was putting makeup on everybody every day. Um, everybody just ended up there. This is um, Tom Savini with his friend Tasso putting a fake chest and stomach on him because later real intestines would be put inside of it and the zombies would tear open the foam rubber and pull out the intestines. Um, so Tom was over in the corner doing this stuff in the community room while everybody else was getting makeup and just talking. And it, it was like a party atmosphere. Everybody was just hanging out. Um, and here was Tom. Nobody had a clue who he was because he wasn't Tom Savini yet. He was just, uh, I mean, Dawn of the Dead wasn't released. Um, Martin wasn't released. This is Martin, by the way, John Amplis. He was putting makeup on everybody, too. Whoever was available slathered everybody with makeup, and that was about it, slathering. It, it wasn't done in detail. Um, whenever they needed us, they would herd us down to whatever part of the mall we were to be filming at, and some people stood around and watched, and other people just um, hung around and did nothing. Um, but it was basically George Romero thinking about what he was going to be doing next. There was no, I, I never saw a script. I didn't know what the story was. I had no clue who the actors were. Um, this thing just seemed to be shots that made no sense to me because everything was filmed out of order that day. I mean, when you look at a movie, it makes sense, beginning, middle, and end. I had no clue what was happening because it was filmed so much out of order and out of sequence. So they would herd us down, and they took us to the um, ice skating rink. Now, this is now a food court, but back then it was ice skating. They even used it in the movie Flashdance. Um, zombies learned how to walk as zombies here. And by the way, this gun is real. Um, Clayton Hill was in charge of the bullets and the guns, and whenever you saw guns being shot and mannequins on the ice, they were using real bullets. Um, but as I was saying, zombies learned how to walk on that ice as a zombie. I don't know if you've ever, um, well, I'll come back to that in a little bit. This is Tony Buba's arm. He was the sound man. I've known Tony since going to college together at Edinburgh. But Tom was putting this together spur of the moment using foam rubber and paint and glue. And from what I understand and what I heard, they sort of made this up whenever uh, uh, that day Tony was going to put his arm into a blood pressure machine. And this was the arm that would be torn off by the zombies. And Tom was just inventing this and making it spur of the moment. Um, in his little crafts corner, and that's exactly what it was. Tom Savini had a little crafts corner in the corner of the community room, and he just used his paint, his glue, and all of his things and made the most unique kind of sculptures um, that, that are imaginable. This is Boris the Stunt Dummy. He was used a couple times during the days I was filming. Um, I was stuck in a hockey net. Zombies are stupid, so walking on the ice, I ended up in this hockey net. But basically, um, we didn't have skates. And if you've ever been in winter weather when the ice hits the sidewalks and you're trying to walk to your car on an icy driveway and you slip and you fall, and no matter how hard you try to stay up, that happens, um, that's what we dealt with. Here's a gunshot. See the reaction? They were using real guns there. So when you see these zombies walking without skates, they were walking trying to keep up because they didn't want to fall down. Um, a couple of them did slip and fall, some on purpose. Some actually did it because of the ice. But people were walking trying to keep upright, and that's why you see them walking like this. So maybe that had something to do with the zombie walk that was um, so famous in the Romero films. Zombies on ice. This is the community room again. Um, there was an unfortunate accident. They used too many explosives, and they damaged the ceiling of the mall and broke a window. Nobody was expecting it, and nobody was too happy about it, but I guess that's what insurance is for on movie sets. But um, 
that was that was kind of a unique thing to witness. Um, I, I guess when you use explosives, you don't know how much or how little to use in a situation like this. And unfortunately, this one just didn't work out. But it was interesting to watch. And if you ever go to Monroeville Mall today, this window is perfect. It's been fixed like nothing ever happened to it. Um, this is the scene with Boris the stunt dubby. They were doing an explosion um, and filming him from behind so it looks like a real person being blown up. Now, the thing is, I didn't know when the explosion was going off, so I filmed in real time in slow motion and wasted a lot of film. If you look most of my home movie, the shots are very, very short. And this is Gary Zeller rigging up explosives for take two. But they're so short because Super 8 was very expensive, and I wanted to get as much in as possible. If I had longer takes, you wouldn't have seen as much. Um, but here you have Marty Schiff and another guy with fishing line this time. This time when the explosion went off, they pulled the fishing line, pulling Boris backward. So it was more realistic. And this was the take that they actually used in the movie. And there goes Boris. And Boris was partially on fire, so Tom Savini took him and put him in the snow to put him up. And he was to be used later on that night in a scene where George Romero hits him in the head with a mace. This is where the arm Tom Savini made spur of the moment was being used. It's put on Tony Buba, the sound man. And these effects, I had never seen anything like this before in real life. I mean, they were like magic tricks. They were so fake to see in real life, but when you see them actually occur, they look real. And I learned so much on the days I, I was there because you never saw stuff like this in movies before. And to see it actually being made and then performed, it was unbelievable. So anyway, this is um, Tony's big scene on the blood pressure machine. And like I said, he's a good friend to this day. We went to college together. Um, I was wearing two squibs here. A squib is like a blood balloon, but in reality, it's a condom. The condom is filled with the fake blood, 3M. This is Gary Zeller filling them up, takes a condom, fills them up with the fake blood, and hooks a squib to them. A squib is like a firecracker. Um, then they hook a wire from the squib down my shirt, down my pants, to a nail board, the nail board is connected to a battery. So whenever they hit the wire in that nail board, the electric charge causes the squib to explode, and that makes the blood explode from the condom, and it squirts out of the shirt. Now, what they had to do was squirt little X's in my shirt with an X-Acto knife, so when the blood squirted out, it would have a place to go out of. So this was my new green shirt, and it was basically ruined. Um, but I still have it today, and it's a great souvenir um, to the movie, and I'm glad I kept it. This is Frank O'Harris, the Pittsburgh Steeler, with Ken Foray. Um, he was a guest that night, so he was observing the filming. And basically, like I said, if you see these shots, everything is out of order, and you would have no clue what was going on if you were there experiencing it. This is my group of friends. We were all hanging out waiting to be whatever we were to be done for. And this box of meat bones was from, from a butcher shop. I, did, had, I didn't want anything to do with these because they smelled so awful. Um, but somebody sent me a screen grab, and I'm actually holding one close to my mouth like I'm chewing on it from the movie. So I was actually filmed holding one of these meat bones. And I don't remember it to this day. I still don't remember holding that thing. Um, my brother was involved holding a meat bone, and he was even painted into the Dawn of the Dead poster book holding holding it. But everybody was always cleaning up. It was a mess. Everything was wet blood. They were mopping it up. They were cleaning the windows. There was always a cleaning crew going on. This is my friend Bill Smith. Um, they put a button in Bill's forehead and covered it over with nose putty and they pulled the button out with fishing line and at the same time a blood balloon um, a squib went off behind his back to make it seem like the bullet goes through his his head and you just recently saw the cleanup crew but here's Gary Zeller rigging up the squib 
balloon on the back of his head, there was a little piece of metal there keeping it so the explosive wouldn't damage his skull. Um, Tom Savini's getting ready to pull the fishing line out of his forehead, and George Romero's giving him direction um, of how to move around. And there's the blood on the window after it was done. And um, the cleanup crew was there cleaning everything up. But you can see the hole that the button made. There was a button with fishing line that was yanked out of the nose putty, causing the hole in the forehead as the blood bloom went off. He was very grumpy about this because the wet blood was going down his shirt and his back, and he still complains. This is Jeannie Jeffries. Um, we're f still friends today. She was the makeup girl. She was the continuity photographs. She did a little bit of everything. She was everywhere. Um, at this point, the lights went off in the mall. I have no clue why. I don't know if they were on a timer and it was an accident or if they actually turned them off on purpose. But they filmed a lot of shots using movie lights, and they were a lot of close-up kind of things. So even if the lights went off on purpose in the mall, they were still able to get shots. One of Tom Savini's famous effects, chopping off the zombie's head. Um, this effect was not in the movie. They had a crossbow, and it would shoot an arrow into a kid's head, a teenager. They took the arrow, and they cut it in half, and they glued it to his nose, and they had fishing line so that they could yank it out in reverse and film the shot in reverse. I took my Super 8 camera and turned it upside down and then took the film in editing, and I flipped it and edited it back in. So when you see the shot, you can see the arrow actually going into his face like it would have been in the movie right here. So this was an effect that wasn't used in the movie. Now, this was the last day of filming, and it was, I don't know if it was George Romero's birthday or close to it, but they had a birthday cake for him, and I think it was a cast and crew cake also. And after he blew out the candles, it was time for the last thing, and that was the cast and crew um, photo. But I, I'm so glad that I had a chance to get his birthday cake and him blowing out the candles. I don't, I've never seen photographs, so I don't know if anybody else took photos of that. Now, everybody was getting ready for the cast and crew photo. Tom Savini hooked up a, his camera on a tripod. He set it on timer, so he was able to run into the shot and get the photo himself. Nobody knew this movie would become famous because there were only three networks on television and they would never play a movie like this. There was no such thing as cable TV or VHS. But then all of a sudden these things were invented, and there was a second life to this movie, and it became a cult classic. I was lucky enough to be in it.